I am a paleontologist. That's the research that I do. I got to go dig up fossils and things. That's why I have this pin. I didn't join a cult. Um, doesn't have anything to do with that. It's just when you're a paleontologist, you, this is how you get fancy. Like you, you put on like your really nice looking skulls. Um, and I think that um, people don't always appreciate how much science people really love science, um, really love nature and animals. Um, we've got a, a chat with some of our current and former geology students. Um, and one of them, some of you guys might know Nick Van Duick. Um, I can't believe I'm mentioning him. That's, he didn't pay me for this. Um, but uh, Nick sent us a picture a few weeks back of like this giant worm he found in his yard. And he's like, what is this? And he was really disturbed by it. And I was like, that is a horsehair worm. Like that's an hematomorph. I'm really excited about it and everything. And I'm like, can I see it? And he's like, well, I didn't keep it. And I'm like, no, what did you, like, can you put it in a bag? Can you bring it to me? And he's like, no, it's disgusting. This is like one of the most traumatizing moments of my life. And you're like trivializing it. I'm like, no, this is like, I never get to see these in the wild. Like, this is really cool. And of course I didn't get to see it. But I was thinking at the time, I'm like, man, could I skip class? Like maybe I could like come back late, you know, but the reason, you know, because you, you meet scientists who aren't Christians and they, they have that same kind of excitement for God's creation. But those of us who are Christians, we have an extra level, a deeper level, because we see that nature reflects the glory of God. And if you've been in my classes, you know this, this is what I get excited about, is I get to expose you to the glory of God in his creatures, in what he has made. And it's beautiful and wonderful. And the secular scientist sees it too. They see the beauty, they see the wonder, but they misattribute it. Instead of giving glory to our creator, they give it to something else. We've got a creation summit this weekend. I want to highlight that. You heard Dr. Bill Barrick on Wednesday. He's one of our speakers. If you're really interested in getting in deep in the text of Scripture, you're going to love it. Our other speaker, some of you might have heard of him. It's Dr. Joe Francis. Yeah, some of you remember him. Like, he literally just retired not that long ago. Like, you guys should remember him. It wasn't, wasn't very long ago, okay? But he's one of our biology professors, and um, he's coming to speak, which is really exciting. Um, good to get him down from the mountains um, to come down here. And um, it's going to be a fantastic time. It's tomorrow. It's going to be in the music recital hall. Um, listen, if you're a student, you can go for free. Um, now, if you want to eat lunch with the speakers and everything, you've got to pay for that. But if you just want to go and hear from them, hey, we want you to go. That's why we make it free for students. So you can see my title up there. I wanted to make it a surprise and be like, boom, but then it's too late. You know, um, we had enough surprises already. But um, I get asked a lot. Why are you a young earth creationist? And it's almost asked many times as like, eh, why are you young earth? Come on. Don't you know anything about the fossil record? And um, I kind of want to flip it on its head. And I want to talk about why I'm not an old earth creationist. Because I think when we talk about evolution, and this has been brought up several times this week in chapel, we're all automatically like, yeah, no, that's, that's not compatible with scripture. Right? Um, the Bible is very clear. God made different kinds of animals on different days, even in the creation week. And God made humans from the dust of the ground, breathing into Adam, right? The breath of life. The man became a living being. He's not evolving from another creature. And Eve is created from him, right? So we don't see any kind of progression like this. Um, many people get confused. They only think it's evolution of humans from, from apes, but evolution involves all living things, right? So we've got this giant tree of life there. Um, we've got everything from trees to donkeys to bacteria to fungi, everything grouped in there. Um, and yeah, the Bible does not support this. This is an anti-biblical idea. And we can see that really clearly, like I said, when we look at the days of creation. Different things are made on different days. So Dr. Chow came in and gave you a Lerman. Wednesday, you got a sermon, ergo, it must be a lecture, right? That's our only option left, um, and that's what you're getting. And you know it was a lecture the moment I said ergo, right? Some of you were like, ooh, waffles. Um, but we're going to talk about instead the age of the earth, because I think this is the one that really people don't know what to do with this. Like, they're like, I get why evolution isn't okay, but like, does it really matter how old the earth is? Like, who cares, right? I mean, wh why, does, why does this matter at all? And a lot of times the debate on this centers around what does the word day mean in Genesis 1, right? Like, because um, the Hebrew word day, it can, it can have several meanings, just like our word for day, right? Like, you can say, like, this, this day I'm going to do this, but you can also be like, back in the day we did this, or like, in the day of, 
you know, MySpace, like this happened, okay? So like, there, you can use that word in different ways, all right? Um, so people argue about this, like, could it mean this? Could it mean that? And you heard a really clear presentation on Monday from Dr. Chow about why we do think it's a literal 24-hour day, okay? But people who have suggested it's not a literal day, who have some kind of old earth perspective, they've, they've found ways to work around the text of scripture. And Dr. Chow talked about some of these. Um, the gap theory is one where, you know, you have a, some kind of indefinitely long gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Um, and this was popularized in the 1800s. Actually, it showed up in the, the first uh, Schofield Study Bible um, as one of, the, one of the very first footnotes in the Bible was maybe there's a gap of time, and that's where you fit all the geological record. Um, and you heard from Dr. Chow, I'll reiterate it here, no Hebrew scholar supports this. You can't do it with the text. You're just cutting up the text. There's, there's, no, there's no support built into the text. Genesis 1, 1 through 1, 5 is a textual unit. Um, it, it's all the first day, okay? The other one that was really popular, it came out of this, is the day-age theory. And so the idea is this, that the days are just like these really long periods of time, right? Each day. And so um, sometimes the days are thought to be literally ages, okay? Um, where like when he says day, he means several million years or whatever. Um, another viewpoint is that the ages... Um, are revealed to Moses, the ages of the past, in days of his visions. I know this is really, you're like, what are you talking about? Okay, how did Moses learn about this? And so the idea is that like each day Moses went to bed and God revealed to him on that day what happened in that age. And so Moses wrote it down as days. It's kind of a really complex scenario there, okay? Now, this perspective as well, the gap theory, all this stuff, I'm going to tell you something right now. I feel like this stuff is kind of a red herring. Okay. Um, in fact, I would say it's a really big red herring because as important as this discussion is, you're losing the forest through the trees. You're missing the bigger problem. You guys know all about icebergs, right? The whole thing, like there's more iceberg under the water than on top. The Titanic, you guys have heard of this. Okay, so same kind of thing here. There are some hidden problems. There are some really big things that people are missing because they just sit around arguing about what the word day means. And we're going to talk about three things today. We're going to talk about narrative, we're going to talk about theology, and we're going to talk about science. We've got to talk about science. Okay, let's talk narrative for a minute. Now, if you've been in Essentials of Geology, you've seen this before, okay? But I'm going to reframe that a little bit. So we're going to compare biblical creation and old earth creation, okay? So when I say biblical creation here, what I just mean is if you take the Bible at face value and just follow the narrative, what, what does it say, okay? So... Biblical creation, what does the Bible say? God makes the earth, right? Day one. The sun is not made until day four. Very clear in the text, okay? But if you're going to hold to an old earth, an old universe, the sun must exist before the earth. That's the stellar nebular hypothesis. You've got to have a functioning sun. Everything's going around. It starts consolidating, makes the planets and stuff, okay? Biblical creation, you read the Bible, it says that plants are made on day three, but the sun isn't made until day four, and marine creatures aren't made until day five. But in old earth creation, both of those things exist for eons before you get plants on the ground. Like we're talking about hundreds of millions of years to billions of years in some cases. In the Bible, it talks about birds being made on day five and land animals being made on day six. But in old earth creation, you have to have land animals before birds because that's what the fossil record says. And if you have... The Bible, obviously you know that humans and other land animals are created on the same day, but separately. Whereas in old earth creation, land animals appear first, and then millions of years, tens of millions, actually hundreds of millions of years later, you get your first humans. And then, of course, we got the six days, 14 billion years thing, right? But everybody focuses on the bottom thing. And they miss the fact that it doesn't matter how long you make the days, you can't turn one of these stories into the other one. You could make the day a billion years. I don't care. You're still not getting it in the right order. So it's not really an issue of time. It's an issue of chronology, right? It's an issue of an order of events. And I think that's a problem for an old earth model. You're not just arguing about what the word day means. You're arguing about the whole framework, the whole structure of the entire chapter, what it means. But let's talk theology. I know you guys like to talk theology. You're in your dorms arguing about theology. When there's no one around, you're on break. You're talking to your cat about theology. You guys love it. I get it. I do too. Listen, 
Genesis 1, 31 is very clear. God made everything very good. Right after each day of creation, he says, and it was good. And when he wraps it up, he says, it was very good. And yeah, we sang about that, right? The creation shows God's glory. It's on display. But at the same time, you have things like venomous snakes that can bite you and kill you. That doesn't seem great. You have ticks that can give you Lyme disease or tick paralysis or just suck your blood and get really fat and it looks really weird, okay? Or how about lampreys, right? Which, yeah, see? Yeah, look at the reaction right there, okay? Face that even their mother doesn't love, okay? <laughs> they, they are, they got these sucker things, they attach to fish, they're sucking their nasty, it's, oh, it's nasty, okay? These are just some expressions of what we call natural evil, okay? Um, it's not a moral agent causing this. It's just bad things that are in the world that we all recognize as negatives, okay? Um, and by the way, this is not a recent thing. I'll quote to you from Hugh Miller, who was a Scottish geologist and evangelical, and by the way, an old earth creationist. He said, I need scarce say that the paleontologist finds no trace in nature of that golden age of the world of which the poets delighted to sing when all creatures lived together in unbroken peace and war and bloodshed were unknown. Ever since animal life began on our planet, there existed in all departments of being carnivorous classes who could not live but by the death of their neighbors and who were armed in consequence for their destruction like the butcher with his axe and knife and the angler with his hook and spear. But there were certain periods in the history of the past during which the weapons assumed a more favorable aspect than others and never were they more formidable than in the times of the cold measures. What Hugh Miller is saying is the fossil record is just as full of natural evil as the present. Now, he's not going to say those words natural evil, but he's saying it's just as brutal then, sometimes more brutal in the past when we look at the fossil record. You still find disease. You still find predation. You still find parasites. You find all these things. They're suffering all around us. And that bothers people. It bothers people like Charles Darwin. That's what Charles Darwin said in a letter in 1860. I own that I cannot see as plainly as others do and as I should wish to do evidence of design and beneficence on all sides of us. There seems to me too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the ichneumonidae with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars or that a cat should play with mice. Now, you guys know what cats and mice are. You've seen Tom and Jerry, you got that, okay? Ichneumenidae, what are we talking about? These are wasps, it's a whole group of wasps, and many of them lay their eggs inside of living caterpillars, okay? And the caterpillar is typically stunned or something and it wakes up and it's just like, oh, I guess I survived that, and it just walks around. The eggs hatch inside of it and the wasp larvae start eating the caterpillar from the inside out. But what they do is they eat the least vital organs first to keep it alive as long as possible. And then finally they burst out and they're like, surprise, like a jack in the box and it's really nasty, okay? Um, yeah, that bothers us. And it bothered Darwin. And Darwin's like, I don't know how you can explain that. And Darwin's context of his day, which you need to understand is the people he's reading were what we call the natural theologians. And so these people, they said, we're going to find evidence for the existence of God and learn about God in nature. Okay, so far so good. Apart from the scriptures, red flag goes up, right? So William Paley's most famous, he wrote a book called Natural Theology in 1802, okay? You might have heard of some of this. Actually, this one I know you've heard of, right? You're walking along the beach, and there's a watch sitting there, and you pick it up, and you're like, huh, isn't that crazy what waves will do to the sand and turn it into a watch? What a crazy world we live in, right? Like, no, nobody thinks that. Somebody thinks someone dropped a watch. Like, that's what you think, right? Because you look at it and you know it's man-made. It's, it's all intricate. It has all these working pieces. And so Paley says the same argument applies to, you know, living things, right? When you look at a dog, you don't just think like, huh, that's weird how that just happened, right? Like, you think, oh, somebody designed that, okay? So yeah, I'm, I'm with Paley there. I think that's a good argument. But I think Paley's overall philosophical approach is very flawed, because what he and the other natural theologians they were doing, they were saying, we can look at nature and we can see God's attributes apart from the Bible. 
Well, that's cool. Yeah, you can see God's divine power. You can see his attributes. Paul's really clear in Romans 1, right? But you also need the Bible because there's special things revealed in there that are not revealed in nature. For instance, you can't look at nature and determine that there was a curse and a fall. You get that from the Word of God. As Dr. Barrick talked about on Wednesday, right? It's revealed by faith. We take it by faith. So these guys would try and wrestle with these natural theology things without using the scriptures, and they came to some really weird spots. Like one guy who was a pastor, and he was an entomologist, and he's talking about those wasps that lay their eggs in the caterpillars, and he's like, well, look, the wasp is such a good mother. Look how she provides for her babies that she'll never meet. Isn't that beautiful? Like, okay, maybe it's a good mother, but this is still gross. It's still messed up. Like, you can't just turn that on its head like that. One of my favorites was they talked about lice. Why did God make lice? And the conclusion of some of these natural theologians was, well, he made lice to keep us hygienic. It's like a blight on people who don't have good hygiene. And you're like, what? That's why God made lice? That seems really silly, right? And that's the thing is, is these, these explanations are not good because they're not starting with the Bible. If you start with the Bible, it's actually very clear. Because the Bible tells us where death and suffering come from. They come from Genesis chapter 3. Right? The Lord God says to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the livestock and more than any animal of the field. What's the implication? They are also cursed. You're just cursed more than them. Cursed is the ground because of you, he tells Adam. With hard labor you eat from it, right? It produces thorns and thistles. When Adam and Eve sinned, their sin had ramifications on the whole of creation. They dragged it down with them because they were God's rulers of it, right? He gave them dominion over that. Romans 8 confirms this for us. Beautiful passage. For the anxious longing of the creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption of sons, the redemption of our body. Hey, you know what it's like, and you're going to know this as you get older and older and older. You're going to be like, yeah, this world is messed up. My body's falling apart. I want to be re totally restored, right? I'm redeemed in my soul, but I want to be completely transformed. <clears throat> and one day God will do that. But Paul says it's not just us. The creation itself is waiting. It's like at the dog at the window looking for its master to come home. Wagging its tail, hoping, 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 hoping. And one day it will be set free. Because he says right now it's been subjected to futility. And you might say, well, that's not fair. Right? Why do, why do bunnies have to suffer? Because Adam and Eve sinned? Like, I get it. I'm a sinner. I deserve to suffer. But rabbits don't sin. Maybe cats do. Rabbits don't sin. <laughs> why should they have to, to suffer? Well, that's what the Bible teaches. You say, that doesn't seem fair. That's awful. And I'm like, yeah, you get it. That's what sin is like. When a king of a country makes an unwise decision or a sinful decision, guess what? Everybody in the country suffers. When the CEO of a business embezzles money, guess what? People get laid off in the company who didn't commit that crime. That's what sin is like. It always has consequences on others who were not the ones who committed the sin. And that is why sin is so nasty and vile. And listen, if you're struggling to comprehend that, it could be you don't actually know how bad your sin is. Sin is awful. But listen to me, if you're going to embrace an old earth creation, you can't use the explanation I just gave you. Because death and suffering were always part of creation. They would have happened before Adam and Eve sinned. So the curse would have been here before the curse came, which is nonsensical. And listen, the Bible's very clear about human death, that human death came from sin, right? Romans 5, 12, 
Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. And the Bible is also very clear that death is the enemy of Christ. 1 Corinthians talks about this. When it talks about Christ raising from the dead, it says that he will put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be defeated is death. Right? Romans, uh, sorry, Romans, Revelation. You think about the end of Revelation and it talks about the new heavens and the new earth. Will there be no more pain, no more crying, no more death? That's good news. So it'd be really weird if like, yeah, death is like super foreign to humans, but like animals, like, yeah, no, they're just, they're just dying. It's weird. Because here's the thing. When they, in the Old Testament, they would sacrifice animals, right? Why did they do that? It's not like God was like, man, I really want them to kill some more goats. I just hate goats. That's not what God is thinking, right? They're killing animals as a substitute for them. They're saying, I deserve to die on this altar, but instead the sheep is dying in my place. So if we can't connect in our minds our death and their death, the sacrificial system makes no sense. And ultimately, Hebrews tells us that the blood of bulls and goats never took away sins. It was always foreshadowing what Christ would do one day. And that Christ did pay for sins once and for all. Now you might say, okay, okay, okay. Yes, I see there's maybe some theological issues here. I see there's some textual issues that are going to be old earth. But like, you know, science, right? Yeah, let's talk about science. Because I think old earth creation actually has scientific issues, like apart from theological ones, like the fossil record, for instance. Okay? During the 17, 1800s, people discovered the fossils weren't just randomly ordered. So I'm sorry, you're not going to go outdoors here and find a triceratops. It's not going to happen. Okay? Um, triceratops you only find in the Mesozoic. Oh, this doesn't work. Okay. Um, it's in the green there. You guys can read. You got this. Okay. You can see the silhouette of the triceratops. It's the one with horns. Okay. Triceratops, not just found in the Mesozoic, it's found in the Cretaceous. Not just found in the Cretaceous, you only find it in the Mastrictian. It's a super, super narrow range. Okay? So there's an order to the fossil record. How do I know this? I mean, I've dug up Triceratops. That's Triceratops jawbone. Okay? They're only found in very particular layers. So how do people explain this? Well, if you're an evolutionist, it's really easy, right? The fossil record is the order of the evolution of life. You start with really simple things, and over time they get more and more complicated, and so you get to the things we have today. But young earth creationists and old earth creationists reject the idea of universal common descent. So how do we interpret order in the fossil record? Well, young earth creationists have done a lot of work on this. And I think that they've made a lot of progress. And this is, the, uh, I would say, the most popular scheme out there is the one I think. Something like this is the case, where you've got some rocks are made during the creation week and the pre-flood world. Some rocks are laid down during the flood with their fossils in them. And some of them are made after the flood. Okay. How do old earth creationists deal with the fossil record. They really don't, usually. They don't have a good reason for why there's any order in it. Old earth creation, you've got to hold to some form of what's called progressive creation, where God makes a bunch of stuff, and it dies. And then he makes a bunch of stuff, and then it dies. And this just like, keeps happening over and over again. Why? There's a, way, there's a way he did things. There's not really any reason for it. There's not any order to it. Um, I've been reading one uh, Old Earth creationist from the 1800s, and he was saying, well, what, you know, what's really going on is that God over time is getting closer and closer to humans as he creates things. And so it's foreshadowing what he would one day do when God, you know, takes on flesh and the pure image of God. And I'm like, that's a cool sentiment. Like, theologically, I think that's really interesting. But uh, I don't really like the idea of destroying Scripture to get a cool theological point, you know? And by the way, this is why you typically don't meet old earth paleontologists or geologists. If you're a paleontologist or geologist, you're either going to be a theistic evolutionist, if you're a Christian, or you're going to be a young earth creationist. They really don't fall in between because you just don't have any explanation for patterns. And it's not just the fossil record as a whole, it's the human fossil record. What do you do with these things that we call hominids, right? So we've got a Homo heidelbergensis skull on here. What do you, what do you, how do you think through these? <clears throat> So let me start. Evolutionary model, obviously, these are progressively more human, right? You're evolving ape-like creatures into humans. How does an old earth creationist think through this? Well, a lot of old earth creationists say only Homo sapiens is human. So they would say things like Neanderthals are actually animals. Well, what do we know about Neanderthals? Well, they look like us. They made tools. They built fire. They made art. They had clothes. They probably buried their dead, and they probably made boats. 
So if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck, right? Some of you don't understand analogies. I'm not saying Neanderthals are ducks, okay? I'm saying Neanderthals are human. Everything they're doing here, everything they look like, they, they sound like a human. And actually, we have DNA from Neanderthals, and we've been able to determine that if you have European or Asian ancestry, you have Neanderthal DNA in you because your ancestors intermarried with them. So they better be humans. And you think, oh, well then, obviously all the old earth creationists would abandon this position that they're animals. No. A lot of them have doubled down on this. And so you're like, you're implying that our ancestors committed bestiality and we're descendants of that? And they're like, yep. And that's messed up. And I don't even want to jump into that theological territory of what percentage of human soul do you have. That's really messed up. So how would a young earth creationist explain this? Well, we'd say, hey, these are members of the human family just like us. And we understand them as descendants of Adam and Eve. And as such, they are people made in God's image. Yes, they look different than us in some ways, but we should be really cautious about assuming that people who look different than us are somehow less human. Because Europeans have a really long and painful history of making those kinds of bad calls, right? Putting pygmies and Australian Aborigines in zoos, those are things that happened, okay? These people can't defend themselves because they're dead. But I think we should be really careful. And if they're doing human things and looking like humans, they're probably humans. But it's not just those things. Let's talk about Noah's flood. Because a lot of times when we talk about this creation debate, everyone just wants to talk about like, you know, the creation week. But I already showed you the fall is a big part of this, but also the flood. Because people were like, oh yeah, there's a global flood. But then in the 1800s, as they started to recognize the age of the earth and like, oh, the earth's really old. They said, oh, Noah's flood happened. It's just the most recent of geological catastrophes, which actually turned out to be ice age deposits, what they were looking at. And then some people were like, well, the flood was so gentle, it left no record at all. It didn't even knock down a tree. Have you seen a flood before? Like, that's ridiculous, you know? And so nowadays, most people, if you're a theistic evolutionist or you're an old earth creationist, you argue for what's called a local flood, the local flood hypothesis. And the idea is that somewhere, typically the Black Sea region, there was this giant flood and that People who were there, they thought the whole earth was underwater, even though it really wasn't. And you say, why on earth would they bend the text of scripture to say something like that? Because if you accept an old earth, you already have humans all over the earth by like 20,000 years before the present. You've got humans in the Americas, you've got humans in Australia. The only place they're not settling is Antarctica and oddly enough New Zealand, because it's hard to get to, okay? So if you want to have a global flood, you have to have some kind of evidence in the rocks, and you don't have it at like a few thousand years ago in their model. And so what do you do? Well, instead of denying all this, they just say, okay, well, the flood was just local. So what am I trying to point out to you here? Listen, commitment to an old earth leads to a rejection of a plain reading of the creation account, which is Genesis 1 and 2, the fall and the curse, which is Genesis 3, and the flood, which is Genesis 6 through 9. This is not a good hermeneutical track record. Because also the Tower of Babel has to be called into question here. You have to reinterpret that. Because you've already got humans all over the earth. So it doesn't work. So when you commit yourself to this, realize you are sacrificing scripture after scripture after scripture. And that's concerning. And you say, some people say, but why do things look old? We were talking about this in origins class yesterday. And so some old earth creationists have said, wouldn't it be deceptive of God to make nature look old when it's actually not? Like you look at the rocks or you look at the stars far away and they look really old. So wouldn't God be lying if he did that? But you know what? You can flip this on its head. I mean, after all, wouldn't it be deceptive of God to actually make things be old, but then make it sound in the Bible like they're not? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I would argue that's more deceptive, right? Because the scriptures are the direct communication of God. And so if God actually made everything old and then he's like, well, I'm going to make it sound like it's young. That'd be really weird. Really, when it comes down to it, the question is, what is my authority going to be? Or maybe better put, where am I going to place the ambiguity? Okay, because no matter what position you pick, there's things that are hard to explain and hard to understand. And that's life. That's how life works. For the old earth creationist, they say, I know enough about science to have certainty. 
So I feel like there must be ambiguity in the text of Scripture. But a young earth creationist instead is saying, I see the Scriptures are clear, and so the misunderstanding that we're having must be things we're doing as scientists. So what you want to ask yourself is, which is a clearer communication from God? God's special revelation or his creation? And you'll hear sometimes older creation saying things like, nature is God's second book. And I think actually this kind of perspective isn't ultimately very helpful. Because it confuses the concepts of general revelation with human discovery and knowledge, which is what we call science. So Dr. Chow has talked about this in publications. If you look up the Center for Thinking Biblically, um, where we got a bunch of video resources, there's one on there where he talks about this. Yes, nature declares God's glory. That's clear in Psalm 19 and Romans 1 and all over the place, right? And it just declares his attributes. That's general revelation. But that's different from us trying to learn things about nature. That's what we call science. One is the revelation of God. The other is our attempt to discover things. Now, ultimately, God's word and his world do agree. I'm confident of that because the same God made both. But that doesn't mean it's always going to be easy to understand how they agree. It doesn't mean you're like, oh, I know the Bible's true, so I should be able to go out and figure out everything in science. Why would you think that? Have you ever taken a science class? It's hard, right? And if you look at the history of science, there's all these people who are like, guys, obviously, I mean, come on, the earth doesn't move, duh, right? And they're like, oh, actually it does, right? And this is how science goes. And that's okay, that's good. But the revelation of God is clear and timeless and true. And we can depend on that. And so let me wrap things up for you. Why am I not an old earth creationist? Because old earth creation seeks to solve issues between science and the Bible. But instead, I think it actually damages both of them. It's trying to like pull them together, which is an admirable goal. I think we should be trying to do that. We should be trying to understand how they work together. But in the process of trying to save some kind of relationship, I think it actually makes both of them worse. And that's not what we want. Ultimately, whether it's this issue or any issue in your life, the Bible is your foundation. That's what we're committed here to, right? This is why we have the Master's University, is because we are of the belief that regardless of your field, you must have your faith in Christ and his word. And that allows you to go out and do the things in your field. But I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment at the end here to talk about the way we engage with people. Because some of you might want to leave here and be like, ha ha, finally I can talk to that old earth uncle I have. Show him what's up. How dare he come around with his old earth ideas. Sneak into our house on Thanksgiving. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, I don't have an uncle like that. All right. Listen, there are Christians, people who are your brothers and sisters who are old earth creationists. Charles Spurgeon was fine with an old earth. Am I not going to listen to anything Charles Spurgeon ever said? No. He said tons of wonderful stuff. This is one of the things you have to work through as a Christian, and especially here at Masters, is how do I engage with people who think differently? And this, is, this whole chapel series is about life, right? How do you live the Christian life? And part of that means you've got to live alongside people who disagree with you. Thankfully, there's a lot in the Bible about how to do that. About speaking to one another in love. The passage we love to use about apologetics, right? 1 Peter 3.15. Be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you with the hope that's inside you. And then we stop there. But it keeps going, right? Yet with gentleness and reverence. Or gentleness and respect. That's how we're supposed to speak to people. Let people know you not just by your truth that you believe, but the way that makes you live your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that your word is clear. You did not leave us in the dark. You revealed things to us that we otherwise would not know. And Lord, that's awesome. That's wonderful. And Lord, your creation is awesome and wonderful too, and it does show your glory, and it is a beautiful, wonderful thing. But Lord, help us not to exalt all, our reason above what you have revealed to us. Help us always to humble ourselves before you and realize, hey, we might be getting things wrong. And to trust you as the source of all wisdom and knowledge. 
I pray for all these students. Help them throughout this day as they're heading into the weekend. Lord, give them a desire to worship you, to serve you. And it's your name I pray. Amen.